Well, hello, everybody. It is Wednesday afternoon, uh, 3.30 p.m. Threw you a curveball there. I had a last-minute appointment, had to bump the time for a half hour. No big deal. Everything is working just the way it should be on this guy. Because um, Dennis gave me a physical before the show. The appointment was for a contractor inside the house. But I figured, you know what, Dennis, you've, you've been watching videos on YouTube about how to give... Uh, colonoscopies and I'm due for one. So uh, I let him use the cell phone camera and uh, pile up free everybody. Thanks buddy. No problem. I got on those big rubber gloves and I said, just relax. My phone went into one of those waterproof cases and uh, yeah, he's good to go. I'm good to go. He, in fact, he even said, he goes, this reminds me of when I was on the farm doing this to a cow. And I was like, well, that's kind of hurtful, especially since I'm not from a farm. So, wow, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, your wife is. But, but, but leave it to Andy. We were just talking about who likes to keep this a nice PG show and who goes down. Well, the colors came out. You know, our guest who was so gracious to be able to help us out with the timing, he's in the back room. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait to introduce him. We got lots of questions to ask. We do. Randy Howe, hello. And Randy, thank you. Popping links. Look at that. Paul's website. Rocketfiction.com. You guys should go there. And uh, if you can, while you're watching this, and just check out some of the artwork. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Marcus is in the house. Joe Bernardo. Dan Genovese. What is up? Uh, Eric Huffles. Hello. Uh, Willie Wonkanobi. There you go. Brian Blevins is here. Brian. Oh, would you look at that? I'm happy to see my favorite people, people side by side to give us another. Why, oh, thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. Live long and prosper, Brian. That's right. And we do have a guest. Oh, wow. It just started pouring out. That's nice. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, that usually means that, oh, wow, it really is. It's that usually out. means our internet's going to take a crap at some point here. At some point. Because <laughs> that's how it rolls, guys. So, yeah. So, our guest is Paul Ravoche. Uh, I first saw uh, his work on some Superman covers. Uh, I believe that was the 90s. And, of course, one of my favorite characters, Tom Strong. Uh, he did some stuff in Tom Strong's Terrific Tales, which I just thought was fantastic. So, uh, without uh, further ado, hello, Paul. Hey, hey guys. Paul. How you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. If you're ever in town and want a colonoscopy, this guy will do it for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, but Paul, you're supposed to do it like every five years. It's not yeah, one and done. You get me right into another topic away from comics. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know how you guys roll up in Canada, but down here we like to check that every five years. Once you yeah, get that's big pharma stuff, Andy. I'm not, I'm not on board that train anymore. So, Man, okay. I had, I had to do it every year since I was 29. So yeah. I, I, I hate them with every fiber of my being, but I find the, uh, it's been good. So uh, I just had mine, what, month and a half ago, and now I'm good. And not on the farm, though. <laughs> no, no, but they know him so well. His doctor's office says he gets it done almost yearly that when he comes in, they give him flowers and chocolate. They're like, hello, Mr. Turner. Here's your dozen roses and box of chocolates. Now drop your pants. At least, at least now they, they put me out. The first one I ever had done was a flex, a flex sig. You stay awake for it. You get to watch the whole thing on the monitor. Don't know why we're talking about colon. Is this TMI for your audience? Yeah, you, you said you like raunchy, so I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, real quick, two bucks. Randy Howell, thank you. A special hail to my fellow Canuck. Paul Reboche. Oh, hey, Randy. look at that. There you go. Well, we like to kick the show off with new guests. Dennis, take it away. So, Paul, since you're the first time on our show and we couldn't wait to meet you, we always like to find out in the world of comic books, you know, everybody has their origin story, how they got into it. Tell us your origin story, what got you into comics, maybe like your first comic as a kid, if you bought them or given yeah. them, and how you got in the industry. Yeah, that's a long story. I mean, just stop me if I go on too long. But uh, probably the earliest comics I remember, uh, maybe, you know, things like the Gil Kane Green Lanterns in the, oh. early, in the early to mid-60s. And... Wow. Uh, 
but I'll tell my story and, th and things like Legion of Superheroes. I was a DC Comics kid. For whatever oh, okay. reason, I didn't have enough money or glom onto the Marvel because my parents gave me so much money and I like DC. But um, so I grew up uh, in the 60s, the 1960s in Montreal, Canada. And uh, then we moved to Ottawa. So it's kind of like a long journey. But I guess comics, like how I got into comics as a professional, it's kind of like for everybody, it's a, it's a bit magical. It's like, how did you go through this long stream of events from the earliest beginnings of being interested as a kid into finally making this transition into being really in the industry? Um, so you're asking me like how I got into that? And because, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a like, really long story. I mean, I first got interested in comics as a little kid, like I said. Sure. After church, we, in, uh, we, were, we weren't that churchy as a family, but we did for a period in Montreal in the 60s go to this church downtown. That's relevant because maybe even as a bribe, I don't know, my parents or my mother, they would give me money after uh, church and, and there was a little comic shop across the street. I guess they could watch or whatever. But And sometimes I, I have a dim memory of them going with me. But I remember the delight of going into the shop, the shop and they, had the, they didn't have a spinner rack in this shop, but they had a... It all racked like in that older style in a big wall. And then oh, the, yeah. the, the lower down you went, the younger it was, right? So they didn't put, you know, the where you couldn't reach it, it was more, more the older books and all there. So I remember kneeling down and they just, it was just like discovering this world of wonder. Like there was like Sergeant Rock and uh, like I said, the DC things, I'm trying to bring back all the memories. But it was just, just the greatest thing ever, Legion of Superheroes. I remember reading the early ones with... Uh, but they're probably like those Jim Shooter ones. They found out later that, yeah, you know, Cosmic Boy and all those great things. Just loved it. And, uh, you know, over the years, it was like, like I said, you stop me if I go on too long. But yeah, go ahead. it's like a whole journey into uh, through door doorways. So it's like you read it. And then at some point you discover that you could you, you can draw. And then the next thing is you think you start dawning on it's like, Maybe I could do this. Like, are there, there's actually people who do this. So I had a whole series of these things, like probably the, the prompt I remember, like you can only remember so much of your life. So what I remember is being at the YMCA. So for any, well, I'm sure everybody knows the Young Men's Christian Association, but it's like the where the pool was near our house. Yeah. My mother took me for swimming lessons. I remember being after one of these lessons and there was a kid in the room uh, there was like a table with a vending machine. And it's one of those like little crystal memories you have. So there is a kid there who challenged me to a contest to draw Superman. <laughs> and like a naive idiot, I, I was probably five or six years old. I walked into the trap, right? So there were pencils and crayons. He's like, I can draw Superman better than you. So I I lost. I lost badly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it triggered something in me. And I started drawing. And I don't remember the exact steps. But I thought, you know, hey, I want to do, I don't know if it was competitiveness or if it was just like, that was latent. But, you know, it went on from there. Like, I remember being in a kid's house in that period. And he had, um, this is another funny th kid thing. He had uh, Submariner comics, but I got into a long argument with him, not only about which were better, DC or Marvel, but I was insisting, I remember, that it was the Submariner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I did lose that in retrospect, although I, I never admitted it to him. But, you know, as the years went by, like, it, it was like a refuge. I mean, I, I sometimes say to myself, Jack Kirby saved my life because, not that it was that dire, that's a little dramatic, right? But sure. when you discover the world of all this storytelling, like personally, I was reading books, I was um, reading comics, and things like Jack Kirby's New Gods hit me when I was 10 years old. So it was just like incredible. But we lived by then in a government town, Ottawa, which uh -huh. I won't completely diss it, but for a creative person back then, this would be like mid to late 70s as I, as I turned into a teenager. It was very bleak. Oh. Like I couldn't drive at home a lot. And there's no internet like people have now where they can do right. all this stuff and, you know, meet people virtually and all this stuff. So you're, you're back there and, and it's just like that enforced boredom got me into drawing. And, and I just, just, when I knew I had a bit of that talent, I was just practicing, practicing. And then I was looking at, like we all do that are creatives or artists, people, you know, I was looking at Jack Kirby and all the DC comics, and then later got into Creepy and Eerie, Richard Corbin. I'm thinking of all the names, all the people that work for, you know, and all my touchstones, like Alex Toth, I discovered later, like who that was. 
And um, I mean, I can tell you the story of how it got into the business itself, if you want. But again, it's you, uh, you probably well, want to back and forth. When, so. Well, I'm curious, did you so obviously, you know, you went through, I assume, high school and all that. Did you yeah. after high school? Did you go to did you have professional training? Did you go to like a college with just art classes? Did you go to art school? Like um, what did you or are you just self taught? Well, mostly, although, you know, what, what I say is um, not to put you on the spot, Andy, but I, I don't I don't believe in self-talk completely because you have to be precise. Like you, even if you self-teach, which I guess I basically did, you're doing it from springboarding off like books or sources of information. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so yeah. it's not it's just not that it's I didn't really go to a school like I did. What happened was. Uh, at the end of high school, I had been like in high, late high school, I had been discovering comics and making um, some mm -hmm. connections in Toronto because there's a guy called Ron Van Loon who ran the Silver Snail comic shop mm -hmm. up here. And he, uh, for a time, got into publishing doing something called Andromeda, which was black and white uh, comic book magazines. And um, so he did that for a bit. And I, I it's a, again, a bit of a long story, but I met him and he asked me to draw a comic. And I spent a lot of high school doing this very rendered comic, finally got published. And then I was like, Toronto's the Mecca. You know, I gotta, I gotta get there because that's where something will happen. Cause there was virtually, I mean, there wasn't very much of a comic industry in Canada, right. but even in Ottawa, there was no, there was nothing like now people wouldn't understand. There's nothing like no graphic novels, no internet, no comics creators really that I know of. I mean, there might've been a few scattered people, but sure. it was a bit of a freak thing. So. I went to the University of Toronto. Uh, I had it several places I could have gone to after high school, but that was a purposeful pick because I knew I wanted to be in Toronto where, where I had met through this Silver Snail connection, a few different artists that were here. Uh, and so I said, I got to go there. I eventually stopped going after just one half semester to um, the University of Toronto the so-called dropout that, you know, but I had to kind of go by my own lights because I just knew, like I did well in school, but I just knew it wasn't for me. I'm, and, and the older I've gotten, I, I don't at all believe in government schooling. I think it's that's well, another whole thing I could rant when about. You went there, when you went there, were you going with the intent of wanting to be an artist or were you going there with the intent of something out? You know, well, just... It was that whole deal, Andy, with it was half formed and you have to, slowly get into the courage of your own convictions. In other words, I was going there at first to please my parents because they said, you got to uh, go to university and get a degree. And, you know, right. I did this starting to do a BA, Bachelor of Arts, and take mm -hmm. all these different courses. But really in the back of my mind, I was like, I want to be an artist. But I didn't, right. I didn't know how to accomplish that, first of all. And I didn't know how to prove that I could succeed at it. So it was like you have to hop off the typical... Uh, channel way of life that everyone's pushing you on and and take a leap of faith you know sure well did your parents know you wanted to be a like in the comics and be an well, artist or yeah they could see that i had the talent but my dad was very strongly pushing me constantly to be not do that because oh. you know he's from europe he, he was from europe he's passed away but he sure i remember him saying he had this conception of like i don't think he understood anything about commercial art like he probably thought, oh, you'll be a starving artist in some cold water flat, like back in Paris where he had lived. He's from France. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like I, I tried to explain to him, Dad, like there's all this stuff. Even back then it was, you know, all blowing up, you know, illustrations, comics, whatever, movie design, Star Wars. And uh, he didn't understand. So finally I had to kind of defy him in a sense. Like he wasn't too, too hardcore, but right. he, was, he was like, you know, you're making a mistake. What did he do for a living? What well, was my his... dad was in the government, so he was oh, okay. uh, he was like uh, working for what's called the um, Ministry of the Environment. It was called Environment Canada back then. They re they renamed it since then, but uh, so he was like an environmental engineer, oh, okay. and basically like a mid level kind of bureaucrat. He was in charge of like uh, pollution, you know, examining dump sites, like those massive landfill sites where they bury stuff, things like that. I remember him. He took me to one once. And he was doing all that kind of government bureaucratic stuff, but he, he was, in fact, I've later realized, I don't know how sort of, uh, you know, conspiracy minded you are so-called conspiracy, but he was involved in, in like knowing all about that stuff, which has now become mainstream platformed, like global war, you know, maybe I shouldn't oh, say yeah. that. 
I don't know how controversial it is. Anymore. Oh, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, you know, all that stuff. He was talking about back in the 70s, like overpopulation, um, the planet's dying. Uh, all right. that, I mean, it was like normal household stuff I heard about. Real? Wow. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Like I could go into a whole, I could do a three-hour stream about that. But what I realize now from learning about it is that that whole agenda was known to people in the government and being implemented way back, way back. It's not, that is not fake. Like I saw it in my own life. And yeah, but even, it, I mean, even over here was like, what was it in the seventies? It was, Oh no, by the year 2000, yeah. you know, the, the water level is going to rise this high, you know, or, Oh, it's going to be an ice age. The seventies was the ice age. 70s yeah. ice age. It was going no, to be I, anything, anything, um, uh, above basically Kansas was going to be frozen. We wouldn't be able to uh, yeah. to to and grow any crops, and we were going to starve. And then on a dime, it it, it pretty much went exactly the opposite. <laughs> and yeah. that's yeah, no, that's exactly uh, Dennis. That's how you realize that there is an agenda for people. Is like you know when you live long enough and you see these changes, you have enough of a pattern recognition to see there is a pattern. Yeah. You know who said that a lot too is Scott Adams. Um, I don't know if you ever listened to his his I, podcast. On but, and off, on and off, yeah. Yeah, and, but it's the same thing. He's like, you know, you see these, and this is kind of a tangent too. But he's like, you know, when you see these, you know, protests or whatever going on over the next big movement, and it's these, it's it's always a lot of young people because they haven't gone through these patterns, yeah. and people like us who have gone through these patterns and seen this, we're just like, okay, whatever. Just yeah. You know, relax. it's, it's a, it's like a sine wave of cycles, you know, going up and down right. because, because it's like, yeah, I clearly remember uh, time magazine. Like my dad was an avid reader of time magazine, which yeah. is now not, you know, no one pays attention to it, but back then that was like central mainstream. There was no internet. Yeah. Right. I have to keep saying that. So people read things like that in Newsweek and they had on the cover, like planet earth, with icicles dripping off. And I remember how terrified you were as a kid because you think this stuff is real. And yeah. then they went on to things like acid rain, you know, all the forests are gonna yep. die. Yep. And yep. There's just an endless stream. So as the years go by, it slowly starts dawning on you, except for maybe the most impenetrably thick people now who still will go, like, I don't know if some people who are my age who, who might even know me go, oh, this guy's really conspiracy bro now. But it's like, how thick do you have to be to not see that you don't know how real all these different things are exactly because information is manipulated, but by the pattern, you can see that you're being monkeyed with because they right, all yeah. come true because they tell you, you know, that the planet's going to die in 10 years. There's going to be water filling New York city and all these ridiculous, completely asinine things. And then, but people somehow forget, they just like go. So like I, years later, I'm going in my twenties, I moved to Toronto. I'm a commercial artist. I, I was the guy like, I'm sure like you guys, I'm going, Hey, wait a minute. You know, they said acid rain would wipe out all the forests and they said all the right. honeybees would die what, a few years ago, Rick. Now, and you go, there's right. just like hundreds of these th narratives that are designed yep. to scare us. And you finally wake up and go, it's all BS. They're just trying to scare us and they're trying to, you, they're trying to divide and manipulate everybody. And then I've had people say to me, like you might have, they go, well, who's they, bro? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, who's they? Prove it. Well, you know, just what I was saying earlier, you know, you've got a whole bunch of these scientists from the 70s, and they were the ones that were talking about, you know, global cooling in the ice age. Right. And literally the same scientists, you know, published papers just a few years later, basically saying exactly the opposite. So we just proved it. And then when you talk to people, they'll say, well, dude, science uh, changes all the time. So they just came around. I'm like, you, you can't go, all these scientists can't go from one direction and do a 180 degree exactly. turn without an absolute reason uh, off there. Were there any solar flares that happened that suddenly caused it? We had the hole in the ozone that has been miraculously and has repaired itself. That was the big thing. That's why all the uh, 80s Aquanet girls and 90s couldn't spray their hair up anymore because, you know, that was bad for the environment. You have to laugh. It's so ridiculous. Well, it's you like remember, a party. I mean, you remember Al Gore's movie. Oh, right? yeah. Well, my kids my kids got it, terrified by that movie. Yeah, like, and none of that. Nothing he predicted in that movie. What, that movie's 20 years old now? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. You know, my, my story about that one, Andy, is in grade five, my uh, 
my older daughter, Charlotte, she got in the car after school when I picked her up and she said, dad, you know, cause I'd ask them, what was your day like at school? Sure. Like what's going on? I wanted to keep track and try and follow the, the, the propaganda stream that was being put into them and try and counter some of it. So I said, what, what happened today? She said, oh, well, you know, it was really sad because Stephanie was in the bathroom crying. And, you know, and I said, well, why was Stephanie in the bathroom crying? And she goes, well, because they showed us Al Gore's, uh, whatever it is, the one that, or, or they showed the film for whichever one it was, the day after tomorrow, where New York City yeah. filled. Yep. And these are like grade five kids that are 10 years old. And she, and I said, and my daughter said, and she believed it. And it's like, dad is the, like, are we going to die? Is New York City going to get covered with water? And and I was just like, <laughs> like first of all, I, I said, no, they're lying to you. And I tried to explain that. And I got into a whole thing later. I tried talking to the principal, got nowhere. And that was part of my red pilling to understand that these people are just repeating narratives. They're not all necessarily in on some big conspiracy, but a lot of people, even in some of these school structures or, or, or big, big information systems, whether it's media or schools or whatever, are just people who, you know, they they just want to go along to get along. They may be semi-low information themselves. Right. And so they're just repeating stuff. But unfortunately, that one got me annoyed because you don't want to be terrifying these poor little kids that grow up believing all this stuff that is just invented and it's it's manipulation. Um, I guess I got off comics, but the finish no, line, what, no, how my journey. Probably, we both I, was just gonna, I was just going to say after the inconvenient truth, the one that really scared me was Frank Caliendo, um, Supernova. Have you seen that one? No, it's. Oh, uh, guys, uh, we, we may have to do a video. Frank Caliendo did one called Supernova. I, it's actually a parody on it, say, Inconvenient it's Truth. Yeah. Yes, it is hilarious. Yeah, no. Uh, anytime yeah. you can sniff out that they're trying to scare you with a big mainstream platform narrative that suddenly rises up and appears out of nowhere and then goes away again or starts, you know it's not probably not real. It's there's some kind of tomfoolery going on behind the scenes. That's my attitude now. But right. but um but back then anyway, that I got I got into comics because by a circuitous roundabout route, like I moved to Toronto. I wanted to actually be a comic artist, but looking back, I didn't know anything. I was like a, the high school, we all have we're all probably the, like the high school artist. So right. I moved to Toronto, stopped being in school. And I, I, you know, there was a huge gap that I didn't realize between like, you could call it a gap across a canyon or you could call it like to get to the bottom rung of the um, ladder that gets you further into the business. There was a huge gap that I didn't realize and I couldn't reach the bottom of this ladder. So I spent about a year and a half, I had dropped out of university and I spent about a year and a half just being the desperate, starving like guy in the basement. Just, it was really difficult. Like we'll probably all have a story. And, and you know, eventually, I mean, again, I'll make a long story short, but I, I one day in the, it was like a, a, a sort of a movie. It was December of, I think, 1979. And I'd spent at least a year in the wilderness of like being unemployed, having dropped out of school, not having proved like, how am I going to get into this business and sort of, yeah, yeah, let's call it monetize my own art so I could be in the business. Sure. And one day I thought, you know, it's one of those little prompts from God or the nice angel on your shoulder because he said, go to the comic shop. You're not doing anything. You're sitting in this basement apartment. So I, I slowly trudged to the comic shop and uh, there's snow falling slowly in slow motion, those wet flakes that kind of stick to you. And yeah, I'm like yeah. in Toronto, miserable winter. I go in the comic shop. The guy behind the counter, I don't remember who it was, but in our chat, because that was like, oh, I'm getting cheered up. But he said, hey, hey, Paul, you know, did you hear that, uh, that Nelvana Animation, which was uh, doing TV specials back here, back then in Toronto, said they're doing a feature animated film and it's like a science fiction film and uh, you should go apply for that. And it's like, a, it's a story I tell about, you never know when there's those one turning point yeah. that it's like a branch point to a whole new thing in your life. And it's like a small miracle because fortunately young me grabbed onto that and heard it. And I, you know, I got onto it like a dog on a bone because I had no work. I had no direction. It's like, how am I going to go forward? And I don't remember how I did it, but I kept bugging them. Like I, I, I kept going back because I didn't have any training to answer your earlier question. I hadn't gone to an art high school. 
I hadn't gone to Sheridan Animation College, which a lot of the people I eventually met, they had they were all buddies. They had sort of networked and gone to school, and which back then was and it's still an important place to study animation, Sheridan College, in Oakville, which is near near Toronto. But uh, I, I had none of those connections. So this one guy in the comic shop before the internet, there's no way to know these things. But the fact that he told me that, and then I realized, I just kept going back and applying. And uh, that's a whole another story. But eventually, this one golden day, the guy said, you know, uh, so Paul, I think he phoned me. He said, uh, or, or I can, he asked me to come in or something. And he said, so, you know, we've looked at it. He had asked me to do these, like, tests. Mm -hmm. give, it was a man called Frank Nissen, who's, I think, still working in L.A. He's worked for Disney and all kinds of stuff. Oh, cool. And he was into heavy metal and uh, Mobius and all this stuff. He said, I want you to go off and draw like Mobius, which I practiced. I brought it back. So one magic day that he said, we're going to hire you. You're going to be a background artist, layout artist, and we're going to pay you 400 bucks a week. So that was like 1979. And that was just like, a, it was like the heavens open, like the ray of light. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Literally, I, I tell people I was on a euphoric high non-drug for like two yeah. days solid because That's it was awesome. like, what happened? Like, I've got money. I'm meeting people. I, I learned a lot. I'm in a business now. You know, I have a professional accreditation and credit by doing this on this film. So it went on from there. And there's lots more stories involved with that. But that was my first sort of validation or acceptance as being a professional. Eventually, I sort of got into comics. It's a, lo it's a long story, but uh, I never did steady comics as a full-time thing. Right. I, I kind of... Um, called myself and still in a way do. I mean, commercial artists, like I did advertising book covers. I did illustration work in the 80s. Uh, when my family was young um, and we had all the t traditional things, the mortgage and the expenses, um, I did tons of advertising art. And uh, yeah, and so I've dabbled in different comics, but it's really, I mean, to round it all out, it's really only now and with this whole CG and crowdfunding and internet thing that I finally dawned on me like okay that's the really the main direction and being welcome like this has been great but that's sort of giving me an entryway I suppose to go back to really what I originally did like when I originally moved to Toronto and I want to be an artist I was really focused on comics and propelled by that and but you know I later discovered I love all this stuff animation comics illustration was great advertising was great for money but not most mostly not for creativity it was really sure. just mm. so yeah, like you know, I, said, I, I remember the first stuff I remember seeing and I, I can't remember the time frame so hopefully you can clear it up were the Superman covers yeah you did um and I was just, I just thought they were so cool because it had a, you know, it, it, my first impression was, oh, it's got a little bit of a Bruce Tim type vibe to him, you know? Yes. But, but then the blacks were real chunky and thick and I thought that was really cool. Um, so, yeah. I, well, I'm still trying to work out, you know, I like drawing in different styles. So it's always working out, you know, what do I do and what, what works for the thing is if sure. it's your own thing, you just do whatever you want. But if you're doing a commercial thing, like, commercial comics for DC. I, I was trying to work out like, what's my identity? And I, I didn't really ever do that many. I kind of on and off, but what you're talking about there, yeah. Like when I did those Superman covers and I did a few batches of them, and again, not really all that many compared to most right. pros that are doing exclusively comics work. But uh, back then I was doing a lot of work for Warner Brothers Animation. So I think I was influenced oh, by the Bruce Tim. Okay. Yeah, like I was doing storyboard art a little bit, you know, 10% storyboard art <clears throat> and uh, a whole ton of background design art, which became my main thing. But um, it was really just influenced by that. But then I, I was kind of like experimenting really, you know? Yeah. So I did a bunch of covers. I think those ones you're talking about, Andy, were for maybe Eddie Braganza. And then I did a right. bunch for, for Joey Cavalieri as the editor. And they, they were, I did these return, was it called? Return to Krypton. I can't remember something. Krypton. That sounds uh, right. So yeah, I just was fortunate that, that, that I made some connections. I was never like super in the super in the business, but I made some connections and got some work, and uh, had a chance to experiment. Yeah. So did you color those as well, or did you just do the black and white? 
Yeah, no, they were color. They were the early days, I guess, of computer. I mean, it's so much better now. But um, I think I did those on a tablet, you know, not a Cintiq. Right. Where you're looking at your screen, but you're drawing down. Yeah, you got used to that whole thing. Yeah. And um, eventually I could afford a a Cintiq and bought that whole setup, which was just great. Um, Yeah, so so I I computer colored them, but I did them, most of them in the mixed way of like doing an original piece of art. Yeah scanning it and i'm really pushing myself to go back to that because i love using computers and screens and digital and all but it's like you miss there's just something you know tactile about using the you know pen and ink or whatever oh yeah yeah Yeah, so i haven't i've got to go back to it because i got like in bad habits and if you call it bad from doing so much advertising art and getting really proficient at photoshop and it's like easier it's sort of a different thing, though, because is, is it easier or not in the end? I mean, you're dealing with layers and files. Yeah, and- there's still there's there's drawbacks to both. I mean, I like doing, you know, the comic book stuff. I'm doing back on paper, old school, because that's how I got in. And yeah, yeah, I was doing it. Um, and then you you have an original to sell to to collectors and things. So yeah, yeah, which is always good, right? Well, I don't sell my stuff, but. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, he doesn't. Hey, hey uh, Paul, we've got a couple of questions, so let's uh, get those. So uh, Joe's asking, so Paul, are you first generation? And what is the proper way to say your last name? <laughs> oh, well, you know, my family, we don't, we all don't agree on it. I don't think there's there was any pronunciation guide. So uh, some people say Rivosh. And I, I started saying Rivosh because I thought it sounded more, I, just more dignified or something. I don't know. So... There's no, sure there's no that it. way, but the way I use it is I just say revoche. Like, uh, as far as first generation, I'm not sure what that means. Like, well, I mean, well, your dad was born in France. Uh, yeah, yeah. He no, he was actually born in Russia, to be precise. Okay. And then, oh, and then where was your mom? Where was your mom born? My mom is from England. Is from England. She's still here, and she's she's from England. And so your first, uh, so first generation means because you said you were born in Arizona, right? Yeah. Right. So you're first generation because your parents weren't born in the U.S. or Canada. So you're uh, first generation. Yeah. 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 And, and right. if with Rivoche, I would have said French. <laughs> yeah. You know. You know. I always say I'm. I always say I'm a transatlantic kind of person because I had the like I I like it the benefit of you know I was born in America, we grew up in Canada, but in Montreal, which is the French part of Canada, at least in my young life. Montreal and then Ottawa, but Montreal particularly, of course, is in the province of Quebec, which is the French speaking yeah. part, although there's English, but because of the, you know, by virtue that it was in Montreal, it was like a meeting point of all these streams. In other words, you had the American comics, you had the British comics, yeah. you also had European comic albums like Tantan, or you guys would call it Tintin, yep. Yep. which I loved and Asterix and all these yep. other wonderful European things. So I grew up with this bizarre mix of like, I call it transatlantic because in the middle of the, like, cause it's like, I just loved all of them. And I didn't have a side, like I loved American DC comics and a, a few Marvel, but I also equally loved, you know, British comics like Eagle, Eagle annuals, you oh, know, yeah, you know yeah, that? Yeah. Frank Bellamy, the Thunderbirds, all that yeah. stuff. And then there was the, the, um, other British things, like I, I grew up as a younger kid reading Rupert, you know, Alfred Bestel or E.H. Shepard illustrations for Winnie the Pooh. Uh, but then, like I said, French illustrators, when I got older and I saw heavy metal, Metal Hurlant, uh, I, I love and still do is one of my top three artists, Yves Chalant, <clears throat> who's like a cartoony cartoonist um, and Mobius, what, of course. What's he known for? Because I don't recognize um, the name, but I Yves might. Yves Chalant, I wish I'd. Pulled out an album, but I'd have to go off screen. But he he uh, he he did uh, Freddie Lombard albums. Um, okay. Mostly, I think he'd be well known for. He, he did this whole series like that. And he did a lot of advertising illustrations too. Just a brilliant illustrator. And for me, he was a real um, touchstone or whatever, a guiding light maybe because. When I was in around early 20s and struggling, I saw him. He, he was only, he, unfortunately, he passed away. He died at about 30 in a tragic car accident. Oh, damn. Yeah, I met him. I met him briefly in the summer of 1989, the year before he died. I was in Europe and I, I phoned him up and I went to see him, this illustrator, Yves Chalant. 
tragically, I heard a year later that he died. But but uh, he was inspiring to me earlier than that because he was an example that I saw of somebody who his art was kind of earlier art was a bit struggly, like he was doing a kind of I don't know half baked version of Alex Raymond American stuff. Oh but wow! When, when I watched his published stuff, within a few years he blossomed into this like amazing stylist and uh, everything working like. You'd have to look at the art. I, I should probably use examples. Um, I should probably do a video on my channel about that and you know explain my enthusiasm because he's not that well known for for uh, North American audiences. But I mean, I learned so much by studying his artwork about design. It's not really DC Comics type stuff, but it's all right. it's all about design and elegant staging, um, silhouettes, graphic shape, just wonderful stuff. So. Yeah, do a video. I'd watch that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I got since I started doing that, I got just a, like a an airport of stacked up planes waiting to land in my brain of like videos. <laughs> that, that's how yep. I am. Yep. So I know what you yep. mean. Uh, Paul Brian's asking, uh, Paul, I, were you a Doctor Who fan? Unfortunately, no. I'm sorry because uh, it doesn't mean I dislike it. I just was never. I, I didn't see those comics or get them or the show. I don't. I guess they had comics. And the same with things yeah. like Judge yeah. Dredd. I mean, yeah. I don't know when Judge Judge Dredd came out, but actually there is for me with like we all hit comics and things at different ages and in different. Sure. So for me, the entry point, like I said, where it really hooks you is for me, it was like the mid to late 60s. Yeah. Um, starting with, like I said, DC Comics, you know, Gil Kane, Green Lantern. Um, then later moving into Neil Adams, discovering Dead Man, oh, uh, yeah. Showcase Comics, Bernie Wrightson, Alex Toth, Joe Kubert, the War Comics, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And then, but then the thing for me was by the early 80s, I was in my 20s. Yeah. And I was like moving into being a professional and, and doing illustration and getting really busy. And I basically, I kind of stopped reading comics. It's, you know, I did catch on to things like Watchmen and Frank Miller, of course. Oh, right, yeah. David Mazzuccelli and everything. But in terms of being like the regular comic shop goer and buyer, I just didn't, I just lost interest and I didn't, you know, now I'm sort of back at that and catching up with a bunch of stuff. But um, before that, it had been all about, like I said, I, I missed saying Jack Kirby. He was like a central inspiration. Right. So in terms of answering that question, the, the British stuff, um, TV shows I didn't see. I was a big Monty Python fan because they were showing that on oh, Canadian yeah. TV. You know, did you like Benny Hill? Uh, again, I didn't see. I didn't really see that. I've seen a lot of it on the internet now, but uh, you know, yeah, I never. I, 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 Benny Hill for some odd reason was on where I grew up. I grew up in Maryland, okay. and it was on, and I just it just never did anything for me. Wow. <laughs> I love Benny Hill, and we had Monty Python and the Flying Circus. I mean, that was that was just especially late night Saturday nights, and we we would see that. And yeah, yeah. Our Doctor Who was always on the uh, on the weekends, which you know I'm a Tom Baker guy from the old the old Doctor Who stuff. And Brian even says it's okay that you're not a Doctor <laughs> Who fan, Paul. But well, Brian, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Brian, I was, uh, but the ones I did catch up on, like, I mean, this is bringing back vivid '70s memories, like, like uh, watching UFO and just loving that Jerry Anderson shows, you know, like, um, the, not only the puppet shows, but then wasn't it Jerry Anderson behind UFO and UFO you know that, sounds really familiar. It was the one about like there was UFOs attacking the Earth, and Earth had made a moon base with these fighters that would intercept. And yeah, and then before that, this isn't a British show, but I remember as a kid, like, okay, so for me, uh, again, this is just my age being in the '60s. My dad was adamantly against uh, TV. Oh, so, so what happened was we were always like me and my older brother, we were always begging for a TV TV because the kids, other kids had TVs. Sure. And I had to go upstairs to watch TV. There was an apartment above ours. We were renters and above it, they, they had a TV. So I used to watch Disney, the wonderful world of Disney with the, you know, the Peacock logo. And Oh, and yeah. Much. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so we're doing that. And then finally we get a TV and because uh, my dad he got a job away. He moved into working for the federal government. I'm trying to think of how to simplify the story. But as a trade-off, because we weren't there, he said the good news and bad news is like, he's like, well, children, the bad news is I dad's leaving for six months. I'm being trained and I'm doing a new job. 
And we're going, okay, dad, what's the good news? And he goes, the good news is I'm going to get you a TV. So we got this, we we're like, forget dad, <laughs> watch the TV. I'm only joking, but. And six so, months went by like that. Girl. Exactly. <laughs> so suddenly we had like Saturday morning cartoons are discovering things like I have early memories of watching The Prisoner, British, you know, Patrick yeah. McGowan. And it just blew our minds. Like where I was like, I don't know, eight or nine years old, whatever it was watching. And I was like, it just was great. It was just great watching this. Things like The Invaders, if you remember with. Um, oh, yeah. What was that? Roy, was it Roy Finn is, Finn is the star? I forget. I do not remember. The lead guy. But again, that was about a mysterious alien invasion where the aliens were disguised as humans. and But you could tell because they had six fingered hands. And oh, wow. uh, it was just great. They had all these series like this. So it is good stuff. Paul, Paul, Joe wants to know, Paul, how about Star Trek? Oh, yeah. All over that. I mean, I have yeah. wonderful memories of, um, again, this is in the period before we had our own TV. I would go down the street because I learned when Star Trek, the original series was on and I'd try and remember that and to get either invited or invite myself over <laughs> and go. And I vividly remember how terrified I was watching the Doomsday Machine episode with the great, um, what's his name? The actor, William Wyndham. Do you remember that about the giant? Like it's yeah, like Matt the Decker. Matt Decker was the captain of the Constellation there, there and it go. was the the... The planet eater with its uh, pure neutronium uh, uh, hull in it, and and its pure anti-proton beam. You got it down. Large planets. <laughs> yes, a great episode. Yeah, no, I like when I'm telling it. It's, I got to chill up my back because I remember being a little kid, and you just start watching it. You don't know what you're walking into. And I just remember in the glow of this TV, just how terrified I was. But how great it was. You know, the whole thing with William Wyndon, he's sweating, he's going, he's going yeah. nutty, and he's trying to whatever commandeer. What did he do? Commandeer the his own ship to ram it into the, the yeah, thing or whatever. But too. do you remember? So of course I remember. He uh he was actually beamed aboard the uh, Enterprise and and uh Kirk and Scotty and the guys had gone over to try and get some life back into the very damaged constellation. Right. And then all of a sudden, the Planet Eater came back, the Doomsday Machine, and uh, Scotty got the uh, impulse engines working in a couple of phaser banks, and Decker commandeered the Enterprise and took it away from Spock because he outranked him because he was a, a Commodore. Great stuff. And uh, it, it was great, and, and they tried to release him. It was just an absolutely epic tale. Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, it's now that we're talking about it, Dennis, like uh, spring back. Yeah, I remember watching and just loving the city on the edge of forever. Oh, just yeah, killer stuff. Like, uh, and then, and then what was the other one? The one with the uh, split faces that everyone remembers with the racism, you know, the, the yes, with, with, the, with the finale where they reveal that, that Kirk's going like, but you're the same, like, what you know, why are you having this endless war, like this centuries long war? And the guy goes, because his, it's on the other side of his face. And as a kid, it's just such a brilliant way of describing. I remember, see, I remember that episode. Do you? The visual of it. Yeah, because it was split right down the middle. Yeah, right? because um, one of the guys was uh, the Riddler from Batman. I can't Yeah, yeah, Frank name. Gorshin. Oh, Gorshin. Yes, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And, you know, talk about storytelling. It was such a great learning ground to see simply told stories, but very dramatic. And it's the way they were written by those really good SF writers. And that, you know, they didn't have a big budget, mm -hmm. but such like one hour plays and, you know, morality plays or whatever you want to call it, but very yep. dramatic, very, very, very clear cut and simple in a way. Yeah, no, I just love that stuff. Yeah. City and, on the edge of forever is, it was fantastic. And, uh, there's so many trouble tribbles. I mean, everybody loves that one. There's such great, uh, such great sci-fi that uh, we could talk hours on that. But um, let's see, we got a few things. Um, Andy and Paul, I am buddies with John Celestri and Brian LeMay. Do you remember them from Nirvana? Do you think yeah. rock and roll was going to be the cult classic it is today? Absolutely. Um, I didn't really know John. He was in the animation section, so I didn't really get to know him. He was there, but, you know, we were kind of in different wings. Um, but Brian LeMay, I remember, and we recently kind of remet last year, excuse me, because we um, did a joint panel at, um, what was it, Comic-Con? It was about rock and roll. 
Oh, cool. And so Brian and I reconnected after so many years and it was great. Like, um, and I, I never knew him super well before, but back on the film, but uh, cause I think he was working in animation too. You know, you just by the chance who, who you get to know. Right. Um, but to answer the other part of the question, no, we had no idea. Like I had no idea. I've had people say that kind of stuff to me too about Batman Beyond, but I, I work, it makes you feel old, you know? Um, <laughs> it's like, wow, you drew that? I was growing up watching that. I was like, to me, it was a job. I love doing it, but it sure. wasn't, I, you know, we all have our own context. We approach these things from, and certainly for me, rock and roll was like my first job. I was 20. I loved it. I was working hard, designing all these backgrounds. Just, just great. Like, um, but the film was very troubled in its production, which is it's famous for. It almost sank the company really? because they very ambitiously went into doing a feature. They didn't have the experience, really. They didn't even really write it fully, properly, you might say. Oh, right. uh, and then they ended up like cutting sequences that were fully animated, which you simply can't do. And then I think it had an audience problem because in a way it was before its time. And it probably hadn't in a way, settled on what its audience should be in the way right. that you would do now. In other words, it had kind of science fiction elements and things like what Miyazaki would do later, but it also had rock and roll and horror elements. And it wasn't right. really for little kids, but it also wasn't really for adults because the adult animation market hadn't really, like who would go to a feature film in an audience in a theater right. and watch it, that hadn't really developed. So in some ways it kind of inadvertently missed the mark. Um, but then later, as the commenter there saying, they, it found an audience, I guess, on late night reruns. I've had people at conventions say, hey, you know, you worked on that. Like, I, I used, to, I grew up watching that on the, the late show. And uh, yeah. yeah, so it, it found its own, you know, by virtue of the Internet and video and re-exposure, YouTube, I guess, everything. Yeah. It seems to have found its place in kind of pop culture history. That's cool. So, I, I do remember it. Marvel did an adaptation of that, didn't they? Yeah, it was a photo okay. book adaptation. Like, yeah, the photo book, right? Yeah, and they took stills from it, and yeah, and uh, see, so yeah, I remember me? that more than I remember the movie. But I do remember the movie from the standpoint of what you were talking about of who is this marketed for? You know, because yeah, I was a kid, yeah. well, it, early teen. I mean, to be to be fair to the owners and uh, people making those decisions, like. It was probably, there's probably factors beyond my knowledge too. Sure. But it was also before the age of the real sort of rise of all this marketing and corporatization. And, right. You know, there were marketing people, but I don't think that um, they really examined all that. I think it was, and again, I can't speak for them because I did know the, the three owners of Nelvana a little bit, but I never had this conversation with them, certainly not back then. So, but I would guess that it looked to me like they did it at more out of enthusiasm like, hey, we'll make this great thing and it'll find itself. But it didn't really because, you know, I think it briefly played and then tanked and they almost lost the company is the story wow. I hear. They had to go into doing a lot of TV surface, uh, service work, it's called, where they took on animating and laying out uh, other people's shows like the Care Bears and Strawberry Shortcake and all these kinds of things. Oh, yeah. And out of that, Nelvana actually rose and grew into being a much bigger company. And I think eventually was either bought or subsumed into, I think it's called Chorus Entertainment now, <clears throat> which is a very big company. So that's how all that went. But I, you know, personally, I'm just really grateful. Like I said, in the earlier part of my relating of this, it's like, for me, it was just a miracle because that was the bottom rung of that ladder I talked about. It's like every, every person who has these dreams and ambitions, you have to find some way into it. And it's going to be unique because there isn't a set moment for that's the same for each person. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, so for me, that was like that. It was like the part, like a magic doorway. Cause suddenly I was like, Hey, you got to show up next week. And the next week I remember is like in a bit of a daze. Cause like, I'm a kid from Ottawa. I'm 20 years old. I never really yeah. even had a proper job before. And I'd been to university briefly living on my own for a year, but kind of being like any 20 year old, I was like scattered and just like barely probably eating. And then suddenly I got to show up. So, of course, I said like to myself, yeah, you're damn well showing up. I got on the little Toronto streetcar, trundled over so, to this place. So rock and roll was made up there? Yeah, it was made in Toronto here at Nelvana oh, wow. Animation. And they, um, like I said, it was before um, it rose into being a big company. So they, they had a, 
kind of a where not a warehouse it was on what's called queen's key which is on the lake here in toronto mm -hmm. and they had rented a kind of building warehouse place and uh it wasn't very fancy but yeah we we all showed up there and everybody was very dedicated i think we we're all trying to make something great certainly that was my ambition i was like just filled with gratitude like i'm here it was like a miracle like i keep saying i guess it's like okay so now i'm in the business and they're paying me to draw and have fun you know it's just great so all your dreams came true look at that just like did. that that's they right did. so paul noah's asking um did you work with the canadian cartoonist seth on mr x did you know him back then yeah, I mean, I worked with him indirectly in the sense that um, he sort of followed on after I left that project. He was one of the next, well, he wasn't the next one. I guess he was after the Hernandez brothers drew it. Uh -huh. And then um, Seth. So I knew him a little bit, not not well. We we met once or twice, but but we didn't really fully hang out, you know. And um, But yeah, like I knew him and uh, on and off. And that was before he sort of maybe evolved his later Seth persona, you know, like doing the kind of style of cartooning that he did. Because when he did the Mr. X stuff, I think I've read online somewhere that he's talked about this. He was kind of finding his way like we all do. Right. You know, what style, what what kind of subject matter am I going to draw? How do I survive? <laughs> How do I, you know, pay the rent? Right. And so he took on Mr. X uh, as one of a series of artists that took, took it over after me. So, yeah, I knew him a little bit is the answer. Oh. Oh, that's cool. How did you get involved with the um, uh, the the animated movie that was nominated for an Oscar? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I love this chat interaction thing. It's like the modern uh, revival of the art of conversation. You know, it's like yes. the town hall. Oh yeah. And, um, so how I got involved with Robot Dreams? That's it. That's what they're asking about is yeah, robot dreams. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. It's oh, for many years. Um, I like I said, worked um, on animation design, right? And so I worked for Warner Brothers for a long time, and mostly doing background design, a little bit of um, character design, a little tiny bits, vehicles. Um, like I posted on my Instagram that I did the main enemy robot and Brainiac attacks, the movie that Warner's did. Oh, that's um, cool. But anyway, then so working for Warner's, and then more recently, I designed two series for a company, a Canadian company called Slap Happy Cartoons in Vancouver, mm -hmm. that did a Netflix series called The Hollow. Two seasons of that, mm -hmm. and so I guess I've been showing that I'm still got, I'm still in the game. So what happened was there's an artist in Spain called Jose Luis Agreda, who's a really great artist and uh, cartoonist. And he has been also kind of like me, or we're like each other, working in animation also. He's kind of multifaceted in that way. So he had gotten involved in, uh, there's a director called Pablo Berger, who's also Spanish. And he had been doing um, live action films, but he fell in love with this graphic novel by Sarah Veron, who's I think in Chicago, if I get that right. And she had done this one called Robot Dreams. And so he read it. It's uh, a dialogue free, I think, a graphic novel about a lonely dog that calls a 1-800 number and, and buys a robot companion. It's a, it's a charming story. And he just, this Pablo Berger decided to turn it into a feature film. So I guess he joined up. I don't know the story of how he joined up with Jose Luis Agreda. I'll just call him Jose Luis. Uh, but he, he um, somehow what happened was another, like, do you want to call it a miracle? I don't know. Something put in Jose Luis's brain, like he remembered me. Oh, cool. And uh, he just out of the blue, it was one of these things in my email, like, bing, there's an email. And he said, hey, long time no talk. We hadn't talked for years. Before that, we had known each other informally on one of those internet forums or mailing lists or whatever it was. I don't remember. Yeah. Clearly, but it was one of the early online things where artists can have a little group. Yeah. So he, I remembered him, of course, because, you know, you, I'd see his work. And he said, hey, I'm involved in this thing. We've done a 15 minute or no, not 15, five minute teaser trailer that they had done a rough sort of slightly rougher version of but very nice he sent it to me he said we're turning this into a feature do you want to design the backgrounds and i was like yeah great i mean that it was just a great experience because it was very um in a certain way hands off and respectful and it's not like everything else i worked it's it's, it's hard to be nuanced when you describe these things it's not like everything else was disrespectful 
But when you work in North America and commercially, um, to varying degrees with different types of jobs, you're not really regarded as sort of as an artistic creator. You're more like a functionary wheel in a machine. Right. And sometimes you're a that's okay. machine, sure. Yeah, yeah, a cog. Yeah. And sometimes it's okay. You know, like for example, working for Warner's, it was great. It was, you know, I don't have any complaints. But but here it was very artistic. It was like we respect you, we want to bring your vision or you know, help to this. I could explain a lot more about it, but that was the basic uh way. Well, I mean, I happened. guess I I mean I I like this stuff. What? So, because I've never worked in animation at all. So, I mean, I assume you got the script for the movie and then the director, you know, sent you specific, okay, we need this background design. We need this. And I mean, was it, was it like detailed descriptions you were working from? You yeah, know, no. these are great questions, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. No. Cause it's great talking to another pro and, and guy, both of you guys that know about this stuff, so you know the right questions to ask. So what happened was, in this case, what was very interesting, and everybody has their own creative process, right? Everybody talks about process. So what they were doing here, as far as I can see, is they may have had script stuff on, on themselves internally, but I wasn't given script. What I was given was animatic reels. So okay. they, they divided the film into four parts. I think it was four or five reels. And... One at a time, I was sent these reels, which were maybe, I forget, maybe half an hour long. Uh -huh. I forget. But, you know, the, you get the idea. So yeah. what it was, it was rough animation. And people who are into animation online, they're going to know what I mean about an animatic. So it's sure. like basically slowly moving drawings or, or poses. And it's a basic, very rough cut of the film. And they had basic soundtracks laid in, basic music. But it's actually very beautifully done. Uh, and uh, by, by Jose Luis working with an artist called uh, Macarena Gill in Spain. And they did a beautiful job. And it was very, it, like to me when I watched it, it worked great. So I was getting this in installments. So I was kind of working behind them. They, they were still actually working on the first, maybe first or second reel when they mm -hmm. hired me. But of course, with experience, they had known, especially Jose Luis, we got to get the backgrounds going early. So my job was to work for about a year and a bit before the main team came on board and I designed most, actually not all, but most of the main settings in the movie. And the way I worked to answer the last part of your question is, uh, so I'd look at the animatic and then Jose Luis gave me extremely detailed, thorough notes and references, which they had gathered uh, on the majority of the backgrounds. There was a few, when I, I finally sort of caught up to them as it were, and then there were backgrounds that they hadn't really fully designed. So they, then in that case, I was working ahead of the script. Like there was a junkyard. I posted some of this on my Rocket Fiction uh, Instagram. There was a junkyard scrapyard scene and they hadn't actually pre sort of figured out what they wanted. So I went ahead and gave them suggestions. In other cases, like in the, the dog has an apartment in New York City mm -hmm. and they didn't have the final drawings, but they had all you might call the set decoration. So they gave me like, we want this kind of couch. And sometimes it would be a whole folder full of variations of things. Oh, right, it's yeah. like it has to be in this ballpark because they wanted a certain look. It was set in the 1980s in New York City. The apartment was something called a railway apartment, which means that these apartments are in a long line with the front. I guess they were old tenement buildings or brownstones that were cut up into thin strips of apartments. So by virtue of that, you always had like these windows at the front and went in the long line. There wasn't like a different configuration. It's kind of cool. It was something I didn't know. And so uh, they gave me references on all this, the different dressings. So some, there's all mixed things. So some of them were kind of in the middle, like there's a bowling alley. I'll, I'll just tell you this briefly. There's a bowling alley that's really fun in, in the middle. He, the, the dog, um, has this kind of dream sequence where he meets a snowman that comes to life and he follows him to this bowling alley. So Jose, Luisa and Pablo said, uh, we want to make it like the bowling alley in the Big Lebowski. And then if you watch the movie, they have a bunch of funny in jokes that are references to things uh, in the Big Lebowski. If you know that movie, you know, Real? Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a very funny bowling alley sequences in, in the Big Lebowski. So, that was like my starting point. You can't copy it exactly, but I basically did a riff on how that, like I would just look at all these references and influences and then I kind of put them away and just create and try and make what works 
that will fit with the purpose of the animatic. Because of course, you're always trying, here's my Alex Toth reference for people who say, I mean, you have to plus the material. He was always right. talking about plussing. So it means that you don't destroy the person's work before you if you're in a team. Right. You don't take it off on a weird tangent for your own purposes. You, um, you, you figure out what the story point is and what the drawings before you are and you just add to it. So what, what I was doing there was like, okay, I get it. I got to keep it within this boundary. Like it has to be this kind of bowling alley. And, you know, I went from there. So it, like I said, working on Robot Dreams was great. It was just uh, fantastic. And then the fact that it eventually, when it got released, we had no idea, like, how, how's it going to be received? Yeah. You know, it went on to be one of the top five competing for the Oscar against Miyazaki, Spider-Verse, and a few, Nimona, and a, a couple of other films. So that was a great, like, you know, great feeling like, yeah, who can complain, right? Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Joe's asking, did they start teaching you the newer processes such as 3D than the animator table standard? Not sure what the animator table standard means. I don't know if he means the old animation tables, but uh, yeah. no, I didn't really. That was a good thing there is that I'm, I'm by no means a dinosaur or an insister on staying in the past because I love to stay current. And so I'm very sure. Photoshop and that and using the internet, but I'm not, I haven't delved into 3D or all that stuff. But fortunately in the pipeline for this film, as they call it, the production process, um, they just wanted drawings and then they, they just wanted good design. So I did them in Photoshop on my Cintiq and okay. I submit those. And it, because it was a 2D film, I should point out if people yeah. haven't seen it, it wasn't a 3D film, so I didn't need uh, I think they it didn't need 3D kind of versatility. I don't right. even know if they used maybe a little bit of 3D animation to animate some backgrounds, but the, the surface look of it, which I love, is it's a graphic novel brought to life. Right. And what's really unique about the film for people who see it, it's going to be out soon in North America. I think I've seen it advertised for Apple TV streaming oh, in cool. May, okay. and maybe in May, but don't quote me, but you can look it up. But um, the great thing is that it's got no dialogue. Just sound effects and music. That's perfect for you. Actually, <laughs> it's funny because when you said the graphic novel had no dialogue, I was like, oh, my God, that is Dennis's favorite type, and they're so hard to find. <laughs> and then you said it was about a dog that called a 1-800 number for a companion. And I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> Dennis is a dog, and he does call 1-800 numbers for companions when his wife's at it. Wow, <laughs> isn't that amazing how that works, Andy? It just came all together. Um, would you do the backgrounds now? Do you just do the line art, or did you do the cut? Did you submit all full color, or were you just doing like you know, basically like line art? Yeah, no, you're hitting me with all the good questions. Um, I would about 90% line work. There's a few, um, okay. that I did in tone just for my own fun, like when I did the scrapyard one, yeah, I just played around with throwing a layer of tone on it, but I didn't go too far because basically. My job was to do line drawings very cleanly right. in perspective. They made a decision to do it in 3D perspective in the sense that it's depth, right? It's not a flat style cartoon like Warner Brothers, you know, where yeah. they do very decorative flat. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So the camera just has to move sideways. Right, right, right. So, uh, which are beautiful. I mean, the Chuck Jones cartoons, all those things. But yeah. um, this one, it was like I was hired partly because I'm good at doing perspective. So they wanted like a real existing space. And so I did mostly line drawings. There's a couple, like I said, in tone, and there was even one or two points where they asked me to do some color stuff. I don't know if I posted those. And uh, just the experiments, or maybe it was in times when I needed to just keep busy. So I did a few of those, but I, I'm not responsible for the final color that you see in the film. Oh, okay. It's a really brilliant, I think, artists doing just wonderful color, beautiful color backgrounds. And they really nailed the fact that, you know, uh, kind of assessing how much toning to do, because it's like the conundrum you get in comics, which is, you know, how much Photoshop rendering do you throw on a piece of line art before it stops being a piece of line art? So right. here they wanted to emulate the look of the graphic novel, which is flat colors, the, the original. But I think they would probably know that if you have a close up on a giant screen in a theater, of just flat color in a line, it can be uh, like say it's a face or sure. occupying most. It can be a little sometimes not interesting enough, right? But but uh, and then the backgrounds you get into questions like okay you have a, a realistic perspective drawing background how much 
texture and rendering and shading should you throw onto that? So they added a little bit of that, and I think they did it exactly right to me. There's a little bit of texture and shading here and there, but it's mostly a very graphic appeal type movie, mostly flat colors. But some very nice um, lighting and tonal choices, which is really what sells the work when you make the right value choices and the right color color schemes that pop. Like I, like I said, I'm a I'm a guy who just thanks to the internet, I've been going back and when I have time in between this whole circus of things to do, uh, look at things like those Neil Adams covers for Batman, yeah, Detective yeah. Comics, yeah, and Nick Cardi, all those guys, just brilliant stuff, like like so simple but strong. And the lighting, you know, particularly like Neil Adams. Oh, well, Neil brought a different level of color to DC with, wasn't he, wasn't Neil pushing for the K-tones and stuff, using more of that back then? Because I guess they weren't. I know Neil innovated some stuff at DC when it came to color. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think they did wash overlays or something I read. I don't know directly because I was yeah. in reading them, but... Um, I'm trying to remember, was Jack Adler, was he the Bain DC guy back then that Neil was, I can't remember. Yeah, they I read all that stuff in magazines. And but what it was is really a course in, in when you have a strong foundation, you don't really need the fancy printing. Because if you look at those, they're cheapo printed. Oh, yeah. But some of them to me look just extremely beautiful. I don't have my Bat Lash cover I hold up every time. But yeah, yeah. Bat Lash, Nick Cardi, like just beautiful pieces of art to me when I look at them. They're so well drawn and composed. The colors are very simple and, and graphic. And it just- Well, they like, knew it, how to, they knew how to, uh, you know, they knew, the, they knew the techniques that worked for the printing capabilities they had. Exactly. You know, they had newsprint, not the best when it came to printing capabilities. And they really did some great stuff on those covers, you know, back, well, the covers weren't newsprint, but even in the yeah, interiors. Yeah. yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. And to answer uh, Brian uh, there, Brian, um, I'm just kind of working out what to do in my next like phase of my artistic journey here. So I've started doing YouTube videos, as you can see on my Rocket Fiction YouTube channel. Um, and as far as art, yeah, I mean, I, I, I need to figure out my next art project. I I'm going to be drawing, I have some ones I've drawn already, various pieces of art that I'm probably going to sell, commission style art. Like yeah. I'm trying to kind of work out all these pe moving pieces, but if there's an interest in people from people of new Batman beyond type art, I do have some ideas about drawing some scenes like that with the character. Cause I, I mostly did the backgrounds as far as the actual literal background art that I did for Batman beyond it goes in two parts. The first part was all real on paper. And then later I moved into doing most of it digitally, the coloring. And then finally, I think the very end, um, maybe all of it. But the fact is, I don't I, I didn't have most of the actual Batman Beyond art because back then I was shipping it physically. I'd scan it, thank God, that I kept oh, scanning yeah. it. But I, I physically shipped it all to Warner Brothers. The latter oh. bit I started keeping it back and just sending them scans as the internet was getting better. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I have a little bit left. Uh, I got to go look at my little drawer, but I may sell some of that. I may hang on to it. I don't know. But, you know, simply if either in the chat or on one of my sites or whatever, if people are interested in, in things that I could do or, you know, I'm a working artist, I like all of us. So I, I do plan as a component of what I'm doing to do more commission style drawings. It's fun. It keeps me going. I might make videos out of some of them all that kind of good stuff. So if you have things you're interested in, I'm very glad to hear it and please let me know. Yeah, heartbreaking. So or if they're talking about, I'm trying to watch the chat. You guys watch the chat. I'll watch yeah, it. Yeah, oh, no, we, yeah. We, we keep trying to bring it up and I'm posting um, um, Paul's uh, rocketfiction.com. Uh, it has yeah. links to all of his platforms, his uh, stores, you can social media hit them up. So if you've got questions and you want to see anything, you guys can just uh, go there for all the access. For those of you that are just on YouTube, I do did put all the links and everything down below. That's right. So you guys will uh, have all of that. Um, and then we did have Jimmy was asking if you were self-taught. Jimmy, hate to tell you this, but go all the way back to the beginning of the show. That's that was right. one of the main questions and Paul goes into yeah. great detail on his back, Come back history. 
Can I comment on that or do you want to keep doing chats? No, you can comment. Yeah, you can yeah, yeah. comment. No, I didn't want to interrupt your chat reading. Um, no, go ahead. Well, you know, I was self-taught, but I think that what I realized through that process is that really in the end, we're all self-taught. So the way we talk about these things, and I hope I don't sound like I'm jumping on that phrase again, because I'm not. No, I'm just ahead. trying to kind of pontificating about it. Like, you realize that in the end, you're we're all self-taught in the sense that we're inside ourselves and we internally have control of how much we absorb or try and focus on. And externally, there's just sources of information. So unfortunately, I think there's people who have a, maybe a, a misunderstanding of that, And in my opinion, and they go to a school, and I saw this you know, in various schools, and they just sit there and they think that if I just pay this money and sit there for four years, like say an animation school, at the end, I'll be a great animator. I'll know the stuff. It'll it'll be injected into my brain. Oh, that's yeah. not how it yeah. works. No, that's and not so, how it works. <laughs> no, it's like you don't get skill and understanding and mastery from that. You get it from your own internal effort and struggle. And again, that's a whole yeah. big subject I could talk about. I'm going to be doing more videos about learning things. And I hope to well, actually think, have a stream eventually. I too, think but. you get, because I went to the Joe Kubert school. That's, that's oh, where cool. I went. And... I think you get in, you get out of it what you put into it. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and I knew for the three years that I went there, you know, I, I went there going, you know, so I told my parents and my friends and stuff was it's a three year school and I want to be working, you know, professionally by the time I graduate or when I graduate. And I did, I started working for D well, I got my first job for DC in March of my senior year and I graduated wow. in May, but I put a lot in. And what I mean is I was always asking my teachers questions. I was always, you know, beyond just the normal uh, critique that they would do in class. I would be like, well, you know, show me more, you know, you can beat me up some more over the stuff. Go ahead. You know? And when I had Joe for two years as a teacher, wow. I was always picking his brain you know. Oh, yeah, that's amazing to have access to such a master. Like, you know, what it brings to mind, Andy, is like the few times I've done presentations, um, like I was asked by an animation uh, college um, in Ottawa to, they had come to Toronto on a field trip and, and to do a presentation. And so this is just a, a sort of an example of this, where you see the mentality so I was in a room in this, they, they were staying in a hotel and they had the boardroom or whatever the conference, and the students were all there. And I do my, sh my shtick, you know, my talk about animation and show drawings. But when you look out at the room, when you're in that position, and you can see the, the, the spectrum of interest, let's call it. Yeah. So right at the front, there was a whole bunch of eager students. And after, yeah. the, after the presentation, they all came up to me. They had drawings that they had done. They wanted me to critique it. I remember we were talking about animation layout. They wanted to just, they were like, I've got access to somebody directly. They knew I worked on Warner Brothers, right? In the sure. mid, there were a bunch of people who were, this was before phones were everywhere, but they were just kind of like listening, but they're kind of like this, you know, they're just sort of like, yeah, you know. And in the back row, there's a whole bunch of those like, party guys or whatever. I don't know if they're party guys, but I remember t vividly they're leaning against the wall, like napping because they probably had been up too late on their field trip. And now I cannot categorically say that all of those guys would be failures because maybe some of them were uber talented and they, they got in the business anyway. I have no idea, but I'm saying that it was for me a very visual illustration of sure. Like, yeah. You want to be the people at the front right? who, who take responsibility for yourself and well, especially that's, with this internet, you've got access to endless reference, endless, oh, yeah. free, endless free information, you know. And well, like, and that's that's like you know when I went to the Kubert School, you know, eighty-eight to ninety-one, no no computers, any of that. Yeah, yeah. And every class, well, I, we never, we I'm trying to remember how the classes were. We didn't change classrooms. The teachers came to the classroom except for life drawing, life drawing was in a totally separate room. So, you know, when you went in on the first day of class, school, whatever, wherever you sat, that was it for the year. So I know in my first year, I was like, you know, I want to be in the front row because, you know, closest yeah. to the blackboard and, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever. Now, I will say in my third year, the senior year, you know, you got to be the cool kid. So I was in the back row with some of my friends. 
it wasn't for lack of interest. It was just, you know, third year. It was a little more relaxed with what you were doing and stuff. Yeah, you know. Um, but when I would, um, I totally get what you mean about, you know, you can see like lack of interest because I've given a couple talks as well. And, you know, you can definitely tell if, if, if it's talks that people sign up to go to, then they're all very interested because they signed up to go. If it's a talk where it's like, hey, here's these 20, you know, people, they don't have a choice, then yeah, you totally can tell like, oh yeah, they care, they moderately care, they just don't want to be anywhere else. Well, they're just avoiding whatever else they had to do to be here. Yeah, you know? no, I mean, that's exactly right. And I mean, to round out the thing about self-taught, like I, relatively speaking, grew up in this kind of Prop, pop culture wasteland of Ottawa, Ontario, and uh, in the in the seventies, and I had to be self taught because I was all I had was like very simple things. I had like a stack of Chris Foss paperback covers, a British, yeah. Um, so, you know, I was trying to teach myself airbrushing by just looking at these. That's all I True. had. No internet, you know, acrylic paints. I was fumbling around. Sometimes I'd do something cool, but some other times I'd be like, oh no, I'm useless, and it would fail. <laughs> to have to get up and go back to high school and wait to get after class, you know, and go home. And then I had Jack Kirby comics and different ones and kind of puzzle it out. But basically yep. you realize what self-taught means because then I got into, I, I briefly actually went to the art college, but I realized they weren't teaching me anything, the real skills that I wanted. Right. And then, you know, I went on from there and, and I basically took it in my own hands to just read the books, do the practice. I went to life drawing on my own volition for a short time. I even hosted my own life drawing thing in, in our, I had a shared studio in the 80s with some other artists. So I remember, you know, phoning life models, they'd come over, we'd, we'd all draw them and pay them. And it was just things like that. It was like, so you have to be self-motivated to be a freelancer in the first place and keep creating your own bow wave in front of your boat, you know, your own carve into reality, which is really what you guys are doing with CG and uh, what I think Ethan did with, with his all streaming. And, you know, it's like, you're 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 pushing forward, right? Because yeah. his story, I don't well, know. I mean, you, you know, you you can't go backwards, so you just have to keep going forward. And you, yeah. you know that saying, you know, stay up with the times and stuff. I mean, if you're not, if you're not, if you if you're trying to make a go of this and do your own thing, you know, YouTube, uh, like we were saying on Grandstream last week, YouTube's an integral part of it. You know, I rank. I rank the top three is basically YouTube, um, Twitter X, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, it's kind of a toss up, I think, between Facebook and Instagram. I mean, they're obviously both owned by the same guy. Yeah, yeah. You just kind of have to know what you're doing more with with those when it comes to posting. But, you know, I think I think Twitter gets a really good reach when you do postings and stuff. You know, Graham nailed it. You know, Facebook. Oh, I maxed out at 5,000 friends. Oh, yeah, I yeah. do a post in the same 20 see it. Yeah, you know, this is really useful information. I'm sure the audience, like, like you know, again, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, a veteran, whatever you call it, I've been around, but I didn't really realize clearly. And and like I said, I make a point of not being the old <laughs> the old guy retiring, you know, I'm trying to keep up. Oh, yeah. But you don't always realize clearly, like in the sea of things, unless you have access to clear information, and there's a lot of confusing counter information. So that was really good to hear from Graham and from you because I'm on this rapid learning curve. I'm very grateful to be learning all this stuff. Like, like as I was for a long time kind of watching it and trying to figure out like, you know, what's the thing to do to actually get traction? Because on Facebook, yeah. I wasn't really getting traction. And then even on X, I would tweet occasionally, but then nothing would happen. Like there was no traction. And well, I part of the so I, the one thing I did learn with with uh uh twitter x whatever still not use yeah. the x but i call it x twit but it's yeah x -twit. X -twit. um I well can't. see i can't because i call him x twit oh. so it gets confusing and i just call him twix <laughs> right um, you guys have a whole thing here i just learned all right um the one thing i learned with that is once i started building up more on that a few years ago is you know you just got to follow you know, follow people and, you know, obviously follow back, you know, fans and stuff that follow you. 
but also, you know, go through and follow professionals, whether you know them or not, because people somehow it all gets around and then you'll just start building followers yeah, more. Yeah. And, and, and they'll tend to follow you. Like right now, we're at a, between 180, 190 live viewers right now, mm -hmm. you know, and people go on and up. Three quarters of them right now are watching it all on X. Okay. Right? So, you know, zero. We, we are on the Facebook. Facebook is completely, uh, oh. is, is just a, dead as a doornail. And all the rest of them are on YouTube itself. And so like you were saying on Graham show, Andy or, and Dennis, do you use, you use StreamYard to do yeah. that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, there's other platforms out there that I know people use, but StreamYard, when I, when we started doing it, StreamYard was the one that, you know, the people we asked like you're doing, we're using. So we're like, okay. And it's simple to use. It's uh we are gonna test out rumble at some point yeah. here. I mean, we, we do upload all of this stuff when we're done, magically goes to uh YouTube and it'll automatically get upstream for I know there's a uh, some rumble people out there, so we do have it, but we are gonna try and figure out the uh because it's a different process, live stream and simultaneously to uh, rumble. So that will be uh, well, this something is, in the pipeline. This is really interesting because there's all these nooks and crannies and like, you know, uh, pieces of all this to learn about. So like, for example, so when it's upload, it all uploads, you, you're not storing these shows locally on your computer or, or are you, do you re download no, no. them and store them off? Like on no, the hard drive? no, actually. So with StreamYard, there is a free version. We do the paid version because you get some more options and stuff. And so for the paid version we do, it stores 50 hours of recording. Okay. And then after that, if you're recording something that you want to want to keep, you better delete some stuff because it won't back up a report. Oh. So you yeah, have to it, it does give you the option to save it. So let's say for a reason right. we decide why well, I really want this interview 50, with Paul. Not if you go over 50, that's the point. If you go over 50 hours and you don't delete stuff to get back oh, right, to right. 50, you can't. Well, what I'm that's not my point. My point right. is if we wanted to save this interview, when right. we're done, can I can go in and say download it and save right. it to our hard drive and keep it forever. Right. Okay. But you could do that like He's that's right. We can do that. But I mean, if you have a YouTube channel, this is since this is on YouTube right now, I could I could accidentally delete the recording off of StreamYard. But I could always go to my YouTube channel and just download it from YouTube. Yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, I'm just kind of digging into the whole matter of like, you know, data storage and, and the, oh, yeah. the fact that with all of this stuff and streaming, you just get endless gigabytes of stuff. So what do you do? Do you and you probably do want to save it because if you your channel did for some reason get deleted, then you don't have anything to re, you know, and, and it's like, it is content that you're going to. Yeah, that would suck actually, because I don't save any of it. So <laughs> no, I really don't. I mean, yeah, because right. like right now I have to go back through pages of like stream yard stuff. Cause yeah. right now we're at like 47.9 hours. Right. Okay. Stuff. And by the time we're done with this, it'll be, you know, like 48 and almost 49 hours. So what I'll usually do is I'll just go in and there's two things. There's one where it says delete recording, which is, that's what it does. It literally deletes the recording. The button you don't want to press is the one below it that says um, it's delete. It's not video, but basically if you press that button, it deletes it from YouTube as well. Oh, that's the button you don't want to press. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this is interesting. Yeah. The, like I said, there's so much to learn about this stuff because, and I, I just love it so far. Like the, um, even just going into YouTube and learning, I mean, it's basic stuff for people that have been doing it, but it's new to sure. me. So, you know, the YouTube uh, like interface with the dashboard and all the analytics and different things. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's very cool. I just, it's very well organized. But like we were telling you on, on Graham's channel, until you get a certain amount of subscribers and hours on YouTube, yeah. The only way you can go live on YouTube is through StreamYard because yeah. it backdoors it. And then you go multiple, like like Dennis said, we're we're streaming to YouTube, X, Facebook, you know, and once we figure out Rumble, we'll do that. Rich says, Andy told me he stores his videos on OnlyFans. Well, yeah, dude, that's true. <laughs> and you got to pay for them. 
rich and your bill is way <laughs> over. I love rich. <laughs> bill is way overdue, Rich. I'm gonna send Dennis to collect if you don't pay up. Just yeah. Well, guys, I know we really have to, you know, we got so much more. We we could probably talk for hours, but we are are limited yeah. on time. And I know Graybeards is gonna be starting. So, you know, Paul, we're gonna have to find a way to get get you back on another time and sure. talk. We didn't Anytime. even get through all the questions and stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, because I never got to my like. I have all my Andy interview questions here, so I got to find. Well, you got to. We got to do that on your channel then. So there, you there we go. That's right. I got to. You got to. You got to. Uh, you got to figure it out, and uh, we can do that on your channel. But yeah. another thing, if you did want to just have questions about stuff, what we'll do sometimes is we can queue up Streamyard almost like um, like Skype, like Skype or or Zoom. Right, it's Zoom. Yeah, so, yeah, sure. Whatever, and just talk like this, but it's not recording. So basically, just talk like we did before the show started. Yeah, if you yeah, just yeah. had questions, you can set you it can up. Just and set just up a time. Go in the room and chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah, like no, I appreciate that. We, if, if you're willing to share your wisdom and experience, oh, I, of course. Because you oh, know, yeah. it, you never know when the one thing, and that's why I even try and talk about my experiences. Where you never know the the one thing you say can be really useful to somebody. And speaking of that. I should probably mention that uh, it's just simple about you know, in the rounding out part of this show. So I'm at Rocket Fiction. Uh, if people want to know more, I, I've got a newsletter that's been dormant. But if you sign up for that, it's easy to find on my website. I am going to be activating that, I realize, and doing probably oh, cool. like a monthly email newsletter. Just something simple. And then also just, Dennis, I don't have a store yet, but I'm going to figure out how to add the functionality or at least yeah. make it visible clearly where... If I'm selling things, I'll yeah. probably make it visible on my site and or put it in my newsletter like, hey, you guys on the newsletter, here's my advanced tip like a week early. I'm selling this stuff if anybody's interested. In. So th that's, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So guys, for those of you that are new, we'll go through a couple. Um, you guys can always go to me, find me on YouTube. And mine's really tough, at Dennis Turner. Look at that. <laughs> That's a, that's a pretty tough one. That's and difficult. you can get Andy's at Andy Smith Comic Artist right there. That's right. And then, of course, as there's Paul's, www.rocketfiction.com with all of his links uh, right there, everybody. There you go. And, uh, guys, don't forget, it's that time where uh, Dennis and I pimp our new project, Quadrat the Awakening, the hit follow-up to uh, the smashing, uh, fantastic Core Draft the Reckoning. This will be launching uh, April 13th or 14th, definitely that weekend, Saturday or Sunday. We're going to nail it down. And if you go to the sign-up page, which is in the, the link is in the description below, and Eric just posted it, sign up, back the book, get this free Adriana trading card drawn by me, colored by Kelsey Shannon. And of course, you'll get front of the line shipping as well. So go sign up for Core Draft The Awakening. Yes, it was supposed to launch April 6th or 7th, but uh, as Dan Fraga told me, that would be difficult because we'll both be in South Carolina for South Carolina Comic Con. Yes, yeah, see Comic Con, baby. So we had to push it a week. Uh, there's the full cover for Core Draft by myself and Dan Lawless. Uh, Nice. There's the homage cover by myself nice. where I actually colored it as well every now and then. Oh, and they picked it up last night on the bro stream. Uh, Aaron yeah. was like, oh, look at that. Well, he knew right away what it was an homage to. Damn right. And there's Bud Root's variant cover colored by Dan Lawless that matches great with his first variant cover for the previous core draft book. So if you didn't get the first one, you'll be able to get it on this campaign and have both covers and put them side by side. Look at that. So, uh, guys, go sign up and check that out. And, uh, Paul, thanks for joining us today. And, yeah, we'll definitely have to do it again. Yeah, yep. I'd love to anytime. And, listen, uh, I want to say a couple, two things. Um, to everybody in the chat, thank you for participating. It's very cool that you're uh, asking all this stuff and participating. It's a shame we can't answer all of the questions but maybe if I come back, we can get to more of them. But thank you for okay. participating. And especially thank you to Andy and Dennis for having me on. It's been great.
Absolutely. You know it. Yeah, dude. And just reach out anytime if you want to just do a, you know, uh, off air thing to answer questions or whatever. No problem. I probably will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if man. I get really stuck, I'll, I'll just be, uh, I'll be DMing you. Yeah, don't worry about it. Anytime. All right. Well, I actually don't have an outro to really play because uh, nice and tight, my previous book that just shows the pencils is at the printer. So no need to run that video. And we're, so, and we're waiting for the video for uh, the Cordrat. new core draft. Oh, so that's right. soon, soon, everybody. So we'll just sign off by waving. Bye-bye. Okay. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Live, and prosper.